This is a video looking at the temperature change required practical, which comes up in GCSE Chemistry and GCSE Combined Science as part of Unit 5, which is the energy changes topic. By the end of this video, you should be able to identify the independent, dependent and control variables for an investigation involving reacting solutions. You should be able to describe a method for this investigation and you should be able to analyse data from the investigation as well. The temperature change required practical for Chemistry Unit 5 doesn't name one specific reaction. And so there are a number of different chemical reactions that you may have carried out for this practical, including neutralisation reactions using acids and bases, the reactions of different acids with metals, or displacement reactions using a solution like copper sulphate to which we add various metals. What all of these reactions have in common is that they lead to a measurable temperature change, and therefore we can manipulate one of the variables and see how this temperature change varies. Because there isn't one named reaction that the exam board asks you to do, to master this practical you need to become confident identifying all of the possible variables that could be changed, and then explaining that one of these will be the independent variable, and the others will be the control variables. Those are the things that you're going to keep the same to make your investigation valid. Your dependent variable for every single one of these possible reactions will always be the temperature change. For this video, I've chosen to investigate the reaction of metals with copper sulphate in what we call a displacement reaction. This is where a more reactive element takes the place of a less reactive element in a compound. So here, each one of my metals is replacing copper in the copper sulphate. There are a number of things that I could change in this practical. The mass of the metal that I'm adding, the type of the metal that I'm adding, the surface area of that metal, so whether I use a really fine powder or big chunks of it, the volume of the copper sulphate, and also the concentration of the copper sulphate. Depending on the order you studied the GCSE chemistry course in, you may not have fully covered concentration yet. Just to explain, if you look at these two bottles of copper sulphate, you'll see that the bottle with a concentration of 0.5 on the right is much darker than the bottle with a concentration of 0.2 on the left. What that concentration tells me, numerically, is that the bottle on the right contains 2.5 times more copper sulphate compound in every millilitre. If you've studied the rates of reaction topic already, then you'll know that having more particles in the same volume will speed up the rate of reaction and inevitably this will affect the temperature change too. I'm going to investigate the impact when I change the metal added to the copper sulphate. So in other words, the type of metal is my independent variable. This means that I need to keep the other four variables I identified, the mass of the metal, the surface area of the metal, the volume of the copper sulphate solution, and the concentration of the copper sulphate solution, the same. To carry out the practical, I need a measuring cylinder, to measure the volume of my copper sulphate, and a balance and a weighing boat to measure the mass of the metal I'm adding. This spatula will help me to accurately add small quantities of metal to the weighing boat. I'm also using a polystyrene cup as my reaction vessel because this is going to retain heat better than a glass beaker, so it makes it easier for me to measure the temperature change. Ideally, I'd want to use a lid in this practical, but in this video, I'm actually not going to because it kind of blocks the camera angle. To measure that temperature change, I need a thermometer, and I will use this to take readings at the start and the end of each reaction, so that by using those two readings, I can work out the temperature change. I start by measuring a set volume of copper sulphate solution. Here, I'm going to use 10 centimetres cubed. If you were writing a method for this, say as an answer to a six mark question, you wouldn't need to name a volume as long as you specified that it was the same for every reaction but it often takes fewer words to just say, measure 10 centimetres cubed. It's important that you remember to take the initial temperature of the solution, because the temperature in the room might change over the course of the time that you're doing the investigation, so it's not necessarily always going to start as exactly the same. Here I can see on my thermometer that this copper sulphate solution has a starting temperature of 16 degrees C. Now I'm going to use the balance to calculate the mass of the metal that I'm adding, which here for my first experiment is going to be magnesium. Here I'm adding 0.5 grams. So I use my spatula and gently tap it to add a little bit of magnesium at a time until I've got exactly 0.5 grams. And then I can add that in to my copper sulphate solution, tapping the weighing boat to make sure that it all gets in there. 
I give it a little bit of a stir to make sure that it's well mixed. And then I'm going to watch the temperature until it stops rising. And at the point that it reaches its highest temperature, that's what I'm going to record as my final temperature. And I'll use that to calculate the temperature change. So here it looks like it's stopped at about 47 degrees C. So that's going to be a temperature change of 31 degrees C. Once I've written down the temperature change, I would then investigate each of the other metals that I have and then repeat the entire process twice more to ensure that my data are repeatable. This means that each time I repeat the investigation, I see the same pattern of results. As well as being asked to describe how to complete the practical, you may be asked to analyse data from it. The first thing that you could be asked to do is to calculate the temperature change for a reaction. And this is often combined with questions in which they give you diagrams of thermometers and ask you to accurately read what the reading on the thermometer is. So in this question, I've just given you a partially filled in table. And if I look at my data for copper, I would see that the temperature there hasn't changed. And then for iron, the temperature has gone up by two. Just pause for a second and work out what the temperature change for zinc and magnesium should be. Hopefully you were able to calculate that this was 7 degrees C and also 20 degrees C. One thing you'll notice in my results table is that I haven't written degrees C after any of the numbers. And this is important when you're writing a results table. The units always go in the headers at the top. They shouldn't be found within the body of the table. And if you do put them there, then you may lose marks. Here's a more complete version of the same table. And in this question, we're asked to calculate the mean temperature change. You should know from your maths lessons that a mean is a type of average and in order to calculate it we add together all of the pieces of data of the same type so here my three temperature changes and then i divide by the number of pieces of data i have so here three if i look at magnesium first of all this would mean that i need to add together 20 and 18 and 22 which would give me a total of 60 and then i would do 60 divided by 3 to get a temperature change of 20. Again, I'm not going to write degrees C here in the table. It's up in the header and that's the only place that it needs to be. Now, when I look at copper, I can see that something a little bit strange has happened. I've got one piece of data that doesn't fit the pattern of the other two. And this is what we call an anomaly or sometimes an anomalous result. And when you have an anomaly that doesn't fit the pattern of the rest of your pieces of data, then you shouldn't include it in your data analysis. So trying to work out the mean for copper, I wouldn't actually include that minus nine. I would just include the two zeros, which is going to give me a temperature change of zero. You might be asked to suggest how that anomaly has happened. And looking at this, I would suggest that the starting temperature is very, very high. That might be because somebody has misread the thermometer or it might be if they've completed these four investigations first and then moved on to repeat two, that possibly their thermometer was still quite warm after doing the first magnesium reaction and it hadn't completely cooled down before they started the second reaction. Pause the video now and see if you can work out what the mean temperature change for iron and for zinc is. Hopefully that wasn't too challenging and you managed to work out that the temperature changes are two and six. You could be asked to display the data from this investigation in a graphical form. And for the particular version of the investigation that I've done, the most appropriate form would be a bar chart because my independent variable is categorical. One thing that you should be aware of is that particularly in the higher paper, you may be given a blank piece of graph paper and asked to pick your own scale. It's important that your data take up at least half of that piece of paper and really as much of the graph as you possibly can. The other important thing to be aware of with a bar chart is that there should be gaps between bars. And again, this is because the data is categorical. So what this means is that the results that I have for zinc are completely independent and separate from the results I have for magnesium. And so they shouldn't have bars that are touching each other. Now, not every investigation that you could do for this required practical would require a bar chart. If, for instance, we'd looked at the mass of the metal being added or here the concentration for the copper sulfate, these are continuous data. And so therefore, it's more appropriate for us to do a scatter graph. 
but again it's important that we use up as much of the graph paper as possible. Finally, you need to be able to evaluate how good this investigation is. One area where students often lose marks is that they see a word like valid or repeatable or accurate and they think that it just means good. But actually each one of these words has a specific meaning that you need to understand. So firstly, we might assess the validity of the experiment. An experiment is valid when the only thing that has changed is the independent variable. So this investigation that we've done does produce valid data because the experiment is well controlled. Now that doesn't just mean that I've been watching to make sure that year nine didn't add the wrong thing. It means that there are lots of control variables. So every time that I did the experiment, I used the same volume of copper sulfate and I used the same mass of metal. The only thing that was changing was the type of metal that I added. The second thing is repeatability. So in order to assess this, I need to look back at my results table. If I look at my first experiment for each metal, magnesium gave me the highest temperature change, followed by zinc, followed by iron, followed by copper. If I look at my second set of investigations, then again, magnesium is highest, followed by zinc, followed by iron. And actually here we have to exclude copper because that was an anomalous piece of data. But then if we look at the third set of data as well, still magnesium highest, followed by zinc, followed by iron, followed by copper. In other words, I get the same pattern every time. It doesn't matter that there's a little bit of variation in the numbers. So here I've got seven degrees for zinc and here I've got five, but I've still got the same pattern. Zinc is always higher than iron and it's always lower than magnesium. And that means that my data are repeatable. So I can say that yes, my data are repeatable because when the exact same person used the exact same method, I saw the same pattern. Now, repeatability and reproducibility are often confused by students. Repeatability is when we have the exact same people and method and we see the same pattern. Whereas reproducibility is this idea that science is usually peer reviewed by other scientists and they will do the same experiment to see whether they can get the same results. And that means that it's reproducible. So currently I'm the only person that's done this investigation. And so I can't actually analyze the reproducibility of my data because I haven't got anything to compare it to. In order to answer this, I would need another group who've done the same experiment, or I would need to do something that asks the same question, but in a slightly different way. So for instance, instead of adding metals to copper sulfate, I might add them to copper chloride instead. Finally, we need to look at the precision. So precision is to do with how finely graded are my results. So in this investigation, I used a thermometer that had a resolution of one degree C. In other words, I could tell whether something was 20 degrees or 19 or 21, but I couldn't say, oh, this temperature is 20.1 degrees C. In order to improve that precision, I would need to use a thermometer with a higher resolution. And chances are this would require me to use a digital thermometer instead. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope you found that a useful introduction to the temperature change required practical for GCSE chemistry. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry videos coming soon.